Uh, good evening. It's at the fag end of a very, very long day and we still have one more talk to go. So I'm going to keep this really short and simple. Um, choosing wisely. Uh, first, I'll go through the choosing wisely, which have been recommended by various uh, societies as well as guidelines. And then I'll give my top 10 as a really short list. So choosing wisely, lung cancer has been recommended by various societies in different domains and different points of care in lung cancer patients. And we have seen, even though the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, as well as the Nensel Trial, showed an unprecedented 20 to 30% reduction in mortality, there are still recommendations for not performing screening. And these have been endorsed by the American College of Chest Physicians, American Thoracic Society, as well as the Canadian Thoracic Society. So you should not screen patients who have a low risk of cancer that do not fit the criteria of having 30 pack years of smoking or who, have, who are between 55 to 75 years of age. Those who have a limited life expectancy, those who are unwilling for follow-up or for future imaging or biopsy, who are unfilled fit, who have lack of resources in their region for surgical or technological follow-up. So this is uh, very well demonstrated by a Brazilian trial, BRELT-1, where a population-based screening trial was performed and it had positive results. It showed reduction in mortality, but it could not be recommended on a population basis because of the long waiting periods for imaging appointments as well as widespread availability of biopsy and surgery. So as of now, we are not ready to recommend screening for lung cancer on population basis. Diagnosis and staging, this has been recommended by many, many guidelines. The most prominent are from CHEST. Every patient should be discussed in a multidisciplinary tumor board. In case of a clinical radiological overlap with other diseases, which are non-resolving lesions on imaging, tissue diagnosis should be obtained by whichever way is the easiest possible. And no brain imaging, that is no brain MRI for asymptomatic patients with peripheral tumors less than two centimeters. And we also have a randomized control trial for this. And this is also being recommended from the latest uh, segmentectomy and subglobal resection studies where they looked at patients who underwent surgery for less than two centimeters and did not undergo brain MRI. And uh, very few of them actually had brain lesions later on follow-up. When it comes to surgery for lung cancer, there are many recommendations, but most of them have been made by cardiothoracic surgeons. So all over the world, thoracic lung cancer is treated by cardiothoracic surgeons and not by surgical oncologists like we do in India. And most of their uh, uh, guidelines and recommendations are to do with cardiac surgery. These are some of the few that I could pick out. The first two, that is routine pulmonary functional evaluation is not recommended in patients who are low risk for undergoing routine lobectomy or sublobar resections. So if you're doing a pulmonary metastectomy or a lobectomy in a young fit patient, you do not need to do extensive pulmonary functional evaluation. And another very important guideline, we have to invasively stage the mediastinum for all resectable lung cancers, except those which are peripheral and less than three centimeters and without hilar and mediastinal lymph nodes. So this is not or or if. All these recommendations have to be, all these three criteria have to be fulfilled. So the tumors have to be peripheral, they have to be less than three centimeters, and they should not have any hilar or mediastinal lymph nodes. And only then you can forego invasive mediastinal staging. These are the two recent randomized control trials which have been published now. Two papers which made a lot of noise in World Congress of Lung Cancer as well as ASCO, sublobar resections compared to lobectomy for tumors less than two centimeters. But we have to remember that the caveat in these trials was that there was frozen section evaluation of the hilar as well as the, uh, the peripheral lymph nodes and a systematic mediastinal lymph node dissection, which was done. So if you do not have access to this, please go ahead and do a lobectomy. Do not do sublobar resections. And also another randomized control trial, a French trial, which was published in 2022, uh, conducted between 2005 and 2012 in 176 French centers, where they used a CT-based follow-up versus just clinical visits and x-rays wherever recommended. They saw that when you follow up the patients with a routine CT scan, that is three to four monthly for the first two years and then six months for the next five years, they pick up more local, re local regional recurrences, but this did not show any improvement in over improving overall survival. The argument which is made against this, that we should adopt a more intense image-based surveillance, is that this trial was done between 2005 to 2012. And at that time, we did not have more modalities to treat the local regional recurrences, which are picked up more and more by CT-based follow-up. But my answer to that is we still do not have them in most of the countries across the world. So you can just follow up the patients by clinical examination and x-rays when required. 
new adjuvant and adjuvant therapy. Lot of approvals, lot of exciting news in the last two years. Adjuvant osimertinib, the most debated Adora trial, and also Empower 010 for resected lung cancer. Um, I, I would like to add adjuvant nivolumab, the checkmate trial, which came for resected esophageal cancer. So all these studies showed great hazard ratios, um, tremendous uh, progression-free survival, disease-free interval, whatever you may call it. But the overall survival data is still not available. And these are not without toxicity and they need to be given for prolonged periods. I think Atizo has to be given for 16 cycles. Osimertinib has to be given for three years. I don't know patients who can afford osimertinib even for one year. So giving in a completely resected R0 resection patient who has got a juvenile chemotherapy, then you subject them to receive a targeted agent for three more years just to get disease-free survival. And we saw the latest abstract from ESMO where the curve seemed to be merging towards the end of five years that it may not translate into overall survival. So this is exciting. This is at the brink of, you know, lung cancer has always been the poster boy for personalized medicine, but we have to interpret this judiciously and apply it even more judiciously in our clinic. Radiation therapy, some definite takeaways. Uh, radiation more than 60 gray and or addition of cetuximab is not beneficial in the definitive setting. Port C, as well as the Langar trial, both published in the last two years, have shown that adjuvant radiation in completely resected lung cancer does not improve survival, and you may actually have a lot of cardiac toxicity with that. And, but when you look at early stage non-small cell lung cancer, stereotactic RT is the standard of care now in medically oper inoperable patients because of shorter duration, better outcomes, and similar toxicity. So these are the three takeaways for radiation in lung cancer. Systemic therapy, there have been a lot of guidelines and I have just clubbed together the guidelines from the various uh, societies and not given the individual references. But these are the four common themes that most guidelines recommend. Avoid cytotoxic chemotherapy in patients who are unfit or unlikely to benefit. Avoid molecular marker testing in patients who are not going to afford this therapy in the near future or who are not eligible to get immune checkpoint inhibitors. Avoid frequent imaging-based follow-up, surveillance, detecting recurrence in asymptomatic metastatic patients using imaging, biomarkers, or liquid biopsy. And foremost, please avoid taking up the intensive care unit resources for managing patients in advanced stage of cancer who are terminally ill and who are not going to have any prolonged survival by managing them in the ICU for days on end. Palliation, we all know the trial by Temel. Early integration of palliation care helps. It's significant improvements in quality of life, longer survival, less aggressive end-of-life care. So a definite recommendation there. Another recommendation for palliative stereotactic therapy, where two fractions with 24 gray were better than five fractions of 20 gray. So my top 10, what would that be? The first one, my pet peeve, avoid unnecessary imaging for screening, for follow-up of uh, nodules after surgery in metastatic patients and small peripheral tumors. What we need to work on is to decrease the time that is needed to work up a lung cancer patient to start the treatment early. We have to stage the mediastinum adequately. Pre-treatment evaluation. So this is not just surgery. Before starting any kind of treatment, whether it's definitive or palliative, the evaluation is necessary. We do a lot of scoring, the frailty score, geriatric oncology score, comprehensive score, nutritional score, MNA, lots of things. But all this needs to be comprehensive quick and multifaceted, we have to get the patient started on treatment as early as possible. And this is something that, you know, will get me a lot of big bats from the surgical community, but we have to weigh the risks and benefits before adopting more extensive or more complex resections versus non-surgical alternatives in patients with borderline fitness. Most of the patients we see with lung cancer are in the sixth and second, seventh decade of life. They have smoked for most of their life. They have cardiac comorbidities. They have a bad lung. They have poor lung function. So you have to really weigh that subjecting them to a really long and complex surgery is it really going to benefit them or they are better off with some non-surgical alternative such as stereotactic radiotherapy? Uh, utilizing new adjuvant and adjuvant therapy, like I already showed, only when there is meaningful survival benefit. That is the only benefit that has been seen so far. The overall survival benefit is a 5% overall survival benefit by the latest meta-analysis in adjuvant chemotherapy for lung cancer, which still holds true. 
advanced stage patients counsel them not only about their uh, treatment options but also toxicities um, estimated median survival before starting treatment because most of them cannot tolerate the toxicity they cannot complete the treatment so why start it at all early integration of palliative care pain and symptom relief avoiding icu admission and utilizing telehealth more and more extensively thank you